Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I always love coming to Canada. Um, I really love coming when the weather's good, so that so far so good today. Um, um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you today my perspective on animal health and welfare and what it means to us as members of the agricultural community. Um, like they said, I've been with Dean Food since about 2010, and I've had an opportunity to work with our, our milk, raw milk procurement teams and sales teams, and I've come to appreciate the concerns and expectations of particularly the milk supply chain uh, from the buyer of raw milk all the way through to folks like McDonald's, Safeway, Target, Cisco, um, and I've worked with some of them on, on their councils in animal welfare, so we also have this cross-functional um, teams where we also look at, at beef as well. So I understand those concerns. Um, but the most important thing uh, we need to consider in, in uh, trying to understand those concerns um, and, and those expectations is to remember one critical thing, and that is that it's, it really is all a matter of perspective. When it comes to animal health and welfare, in understanding what concerns our customers, we need to remember this. Uh, what someone or some group uh, is concerned about really is all a matter of perspective. What you would rank as a stalker, uh, stock grower as your top welfare concern um, is going to be different, perhaps, than what I rate as a veterinarian as my top concern, which might be different than a dairy farmer, which is going to be different than a pig farmer, which might be different than your average consumer, and the customers, and so, and, and that's going to vary along the supply chain, depending on who that customer is. Um, but in all of this, we really need to not forget um, what sometimes, because it's such a political mess, um, this overlooked and yet critical perspective, and that's the animals. We, we often forget what's at stake for the animals um, when we have these conversations, because we're so naturally focused on what's at stake for us. So if we just think about it to put things into perspective, Look at the laying hen. I think in the very most simplest of terms, um, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that she's involved in the process, right? Well, what about this guy, okay? Um, well, I think it's probably more fair to say that he's rather committed, okay? It really is all a matter of perspective. So we really need to understand these critical perspectives of the consumer and the customer all the way through the supply chain. So what is animal welfare, okay? This is, animal welfare is a question about the quality of life. It's, it, that's really the fundamental focus. It is not, just to be clear, a question about animal rights, okay? So animal welfare is about the quality of life. Animal welfare is something that an animal has, and it exists on this continuum of, of really bad to really good. In the simplest of terms, if we look at poor welfare, that's when an animal is suffering uh, regularly from hunger, thirst, pain, disease, discomfort. A good animal welfare would really be when, when our animals are well nourished, when disease, pain, injury, they're managed and they're addressed. And animals really have the freedom to move and act and, and, and they have a comfortable life. And equally important is that they have a comfortable death. Now, if we look at exceptional welfare, that, those might be instances where, where really and truly disease and injury are kept to a minimum or, or very rare. And, and again, the animals have the freedom uh, to sort of do as they like and what they want. And, and I think in general terms, when we look at it, we can, we can say that some animals really do benefit from an overall positive welfare. And, and, and that's what's seen in, in today's terms as what um, we consider a life worth living, okay? Now, I think if we're, we're being honest with ourselves, we can say that some animals, at times, are really better off dead, okay? And that, that would be a life not worth living, um, or a life worth avoiding. Now, in some systems, some situations, some animals might be neither better off living nor better off dead, and that, that would sort of be a life worth nothing, if you can imagine that, a life, a life without experiences. And I hope, or at least I think, that, that most of us here would agree that every animal should have a life worth living, and that certainly no animal should have a life worth avoiding. Now, we can spend hours debating on exactly how to define animal welfare, but in reality, the exact definition is less important 
than understanding what it encompasses. As veterinarians and, and, and folks in agriculture, I think we've, we've really done a great job in functioning in this circle, in focusing on animal health with regard to welfare. But the research has demonstrated that this limited view of animal welfare that really focuses entirely on health isn't sufficient. That we need to consider the animal's nature and their emotional as well as their physical health to adequately address animal welfare. Okay, so to do this, we have to recognize and value all three of these determinants of animal welfare. Yes, animal welfare is dependent on the health of the animal, its fitness, as much as it's dependent on what it feels and what it uh, um, wants to do. So th the key here, though, is to keep in mind that, that neither of these principles is always given a priority. Instead, our job is to balance these needs, making sure that all three elements um, are considered. And, and we have to realize that optimal welfare does not mean maximum welfare, okay? And that would be that little intersection, perfect intersection in the, in the middle, right? And I, I refer to that as bliss, and I think most folks can realize that bliss is not typically attainable, and when it is, it's fairly short-lived. So that's not what I'm focusing on. We need to focus at optimizing animal welfare and striking a balance between all of these three things that represent a challenge. So let me back up for a minute and, and maybe try to set the stage a little bit so we can begin to envision all that encompasses and affects animal welfare. Um, so this picture is a representation of a cat that I met when I was about 16 years old and working at my local animal shelter. Vinny, as we eventually named him, he had been set on fire by some local teenagers. And I was lucky enough to meet and care for this gentle and forgiving little man. Now, that stage in my career, Vinny taught me two very important lessons. The first lesson he taught me was that it takes a great deal of courage to forgive. The second lesson he taught me was that no matter how much I cared, and no matter how good I would ever become as a veterinarian, if I couldn't figure out a way to affect change in the attitudes of people towards animals, I would spend my lifetime treating Vinnies. And that really wasn't what I wanted to do. Vinny helped me understand that everything happens through people. Now, unfortunately, I'm not really a people person, so <laughs> that makes that a bit of a challenge. Um, given the choice, I've always chosen the company of animals over people. And so I had to learn, and I'm still learning, how to work with folks, how to communicate, how to look at that herd picture while still not neglecting the individual. Because in my mind, when we think about herd health, really the purpose of protecting the herd is to protect that individual. And most importantly, I had to recognize that it is that human-animal interaction that has the most profound effect on the welfare of animals day in, and day out. Everything happens through people. Everything happens through people. So we got to start thinking in agriculture, are we going to be involved or are we going to be committed? I think you know the answer to that. So why does animal welfare matter? You know, it's pretty simple, I think. Um, uh, but, but I get it. I, I think a lot of times when I go down this road, I, I, I start to get a lot of angst from folks. And I know what you're thinking. Who is this 40-something-year-old, you know, bunny-loving, granola-eating tree hugger from California? Um, who does she think she's kidding, you know? Doesn't she know? Don't I understand what you're facing? We sit, we sit and wring our hands about it, right, every day. Uh, we have a world to feed. The population's going to grow to 9 billion people. We need to increase food production by 70%. And she's asking me to stop and be nice to a chicken and pet my cow. Is she crazy? Okay. I'm not crazy. Well, maybe I am, but, um, you know, this isn't a joke. This is, this is serious. Animal welfare does matter, and it matters because when animal welfare is compromised, we're less efficient, and we're simply less sustainable. So what do s managing and developing, what does managing and developing systems that promote good welfare, what do those systems do, okay? What, what's in it for us in agriculture? as farmers, as processors, as retails, and consumers, okay? Well, simply put, animal welfare is foundational to sustainability, OK? 
okay? It improves food safety and quality, okay? When animal welfare is good, we use fewer antibiotics, we decrease the risk of residues, we have less damage to carcasses through better handling and fewer injection sites, we waste less milk, and we produce better quality milk and meat. It protects public health, okay? <laughs> Emerging and current zoonotic diseases that can be spread and amplified through animal populations and infect people like tuberculosis, avian influenza, these are all managed through effective animal welfare-focused health programs. When we provide good animal welfare, we provide safe food, free of potential harm for residues, and again, using fewer antibiotics, and therefore decreasing that selection pressure um, on antibiotic resistance, okay? Providing good welfare advances research in <laughs> biotechnology. How good do you think that all that research and data, those results are, if, if the animals that were used in the research that were collected from were all under severe stress, okay? Do those results actually apply to the general population? Better welfare means better science, better data, fewer animals used, and more meaningful progress in the development of medicine and technology that will benefit us and the animals. And last but not least, welfare is foundational to a healthy planet. It is the bedrock of sustainability. How can we increase food production by 70% if our disease rate and mortality rem continues to climb? Or even if it remains static, can we justify wasting 10% of all calves born, 30% of all pigs born? We currently waste 30% of all food produced beyond that. Can we really afford to add to that number? We have a responsibility not to waste any of it. And simply put, poor animal welfare translates into wasteful production that is simply not sustainable. So animal welfare as part of sustainability has, in my view, become a global concern. But we didn't all get here the same way. While some have been sort of treading these waters for, for decades, others have only more recently sort of made it a focus um, within society. Um, and therefore becoming a sort of a line item in the corporate ledger. So how folks got there, well again, it's, it's much like I said before, it's all a matter of perspective. So if we look at the EU experience, a little picture didn't show up there, um, for some reason, anyway. Um, the EU experience was, was actually very interesting, okay? Because their path in developing a focus around animal welfare was very different than what we experienced in, in the US and what I think you're experiencing in Canada. They began in 1964 with the publication of Ruth Harrison's book, Animal Machines. Okay? And this book not only was responsible for coining the term factory farm, but it also raised public awareness around the condition and treatment of animals on some farms. And it was really the motivation behind the EU's Farm Animal Welfare Council that developed the concept of the five freedoms and was, is now the basis of the majority of animal welfare programs worldwide today. With that as the, for fast, uh, the forerunner, we can fast forward to 1989 and 2001 when the EU experienced one significant food safety crisis and a major animal health crisis which took the confidence of consumers uh, in both uh, the quality and safety of the food we eat. So thanks to, to BSE and the foot and mouth disease outbreak, um, both legal and market-driven mandates then came for improving animal welfare. So, so really, when it boils down to it, animal welfare in the EU was fundamentally driven by concerns over food safety and animal health. Now, in the US, we became tangled up in animal welfare when animal rights advocates began protesting against the use of animals in both farming and research. Okay? This awareness was raised to a higher level when animal advocacy groups like the Humane Society of the United States and PETA and Mercy for Animals became sta began state-by-state -state ballot initiatives to ban specific agricultural practices, such as the use of gestation crates, tail docking, battery cages, and laying hens. Okay? And so soon after that, animal agriculture began getting hit with undercover videos showing egregious acts of abuse or neglect of animals, in addition to highlighting some farm practices that, quite frankly, are considered inhumane by many, but are standard practice in the industry, including dehorning without pain mitigation and tail docking. Now, as a result, the U.S. is facing conflicting state-by-state -state legislation regarding the housing requirements of laying hens, in addition to multiple animal welfare audits developed by customers in an attempt to mitigate the potential risk a farmer may present. 
And I know last year um, in uh, uh, on that end of the state for Canada, you had uh, the undercover video on a dairy farm um, that I think got a lot of attention. So I think Canada is probably on a similar path uh, and shares the same path that, that we've experienced. Now, um, so unlike the EU, animal, cult animal agriculture in the U.S. really has, has been repeatedly challenged, not on the basis of food safety, but on the basis and accusations of cruel and abusive treatment, okay? They have questioned our ethics. They have not questioned our food safety and our food quality. So what I think will be very interesting is to see how this issue of animal welfare unfolds across the globe in places like China, who may likely actually experience a combination of both of these drivers, both food safety and social awareness, which will demand the highest quality of, food, of safe food while providing assurance that animals are healthy and happy on top of an ever-increasing demand uh, for the product itself as the population grows and they become more affluent. So what does this all mean? Okay. Well, for me, it means that my job at Dean Foods requires that I figure out what this all means to customers and consumers and how to balance this with what I know we can get done on the farm. And to do that, I really need to understand those consumers and our customers. And again, when it comes to that, it's all a matter of perspective. So, so when I try to group folks, I'm kind of a lumper. So if I could lump our customers into three general categories, I have the customers who I kind of refer to as the box checkers, okay? These box checkers, they just simply send me an email or call and say, what are you doing? And pretty much whatever I tell them seems to be fine um, until something hits what I call the Google fan, okay? And when it hits the fan, uh, I get lots of phone calls back and whatever I was doing apparently wasn't good enough and all of a sudden they're asking us to cut off ties, all ties with that farm. Not allowed to take their milk, not allowed to do business with them, nothing, okay? That has the potential of putting a farm out of business, okay? And that is a huge concern of mine. With all of our customers, we, we, we do face a constant battle of understanding because everybody likes to go to Dr. Google on the internet and let that be their sort of informational resource. And then we have customers that I talk about being sort of on the welfare bus, okay? They understand it, they're starting to kind of dip their toes in the water, they're learning more, they're not quite sure what they want to do or how they're going to do it, um, but they're working on it. Then we have who I call the bus drivers, and there's just a few of these. Um, these drivers, they not only say they want to be responsible corporate citizens, they act like it, okay? They have a vision of what doing the right thing looks like, and they're committed to making improvements across the supply chain. They're leaders. And when it comes to being responsible corporate citizens, they've invested a huge amount of resources in developing and executing initiatives focused on improving their success in specific areas throughout the supply chain. And, and these drivers, they vary somewhat in their, their animal welfare knowledge, but most of them actually have formed councils and are well informed by experts in the area that drive their policy and decision making. And I think probably my best example of that is, is a company like McDonald's, who has invested a huge amount of time and energy and thoughtful um, analysis of how to improve animal welfare um, on a global scale. Now I'll be the first to admit you can all, I'm skeptical when people start talking about being, quote, responsible corporate citizen, okay? That's okay. Th and the fact is we, we can sit here all day and argue the sincerity of these responsibility efforts, but really it's, whether it's about doing the right thing or, or really simply trying not to be the next bullseye of a special interest group, it does really boil down to one simple critical issue, brand protection, okay? My running joke was that Dean Foods hired me so that they would have somebody to throw into the bus when PETA called, okay? It's all about protecting the brand. What many farmers and veterinarians and, and cooperatives don't understand or appreciate is that immense pressure that comes with this critical task of protecting the brand. So whether it's doing the right thing, which means aligning with consumer values or preventing recalls, politics, or policy from negatively impacting the brand, this risk must be managed or mitigated. Now, how this gets done depends on the customer. Again, I was hired by Dean because they, like many other companies, recognize that every relation carries risk. 
And to protect the brand, you have to identify the risks and manage them effectively. When it comes to milk and, and animal ag in general, this means making sure that all farmers are doing the right thing when it comes to animal welfare. Doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Now, when I think of animal welfare, I consider it on, like I said earlier, a continuum from good to bad to great. These first two buckets are what I consider the, cons the areas that consumers expect us to manage. These are under the umbrella of animal welfare. The far end of this brand management continuum, this is what I consider to be standards based on ideology rather than animal welfare. And while folks here are free to gain their market share based on these ideals, I do not consider any of those marketing strategies a guarantee of good welfare. Simply put, what consumers expect is that we take good care of our cows. Our job is to figure out how we demonstrate that that's exactly what we're doing. The first thing we have to do is understand what good care looks like, okay? And to understand that, we need to understand what contributes to the welfare of animals. So for as long as animals have been domesticated, there has been this social consensus around animal use, and it included an ethic for the treatment of animals. There was this implied social contract between the farmer and the animals we benefited from. But now we're being scrutinized, okay? And why is that? Well, over the last decade, society has become more aware of the mistreatment of animals, and, and they've become more concerned about how both companion animals and farm animals are provided for. Special interest groups have capitalized on this concern. If we're going to effectively position ourselves in this dialogue, we're going to have to understand how and why we have found ourselves cornered and accused of being irresponsible, and it's sometimes unethical. So how did we get here? To, to effectively manage the future, you, you do have to understand the past. If you were a mom in 1930, your family pet was probably a barn cat, your dog lived outside and was fed table scraps, okay? You certainly didn't do it, what I or my husband does every month, which is run to the vet's office every f month or so to buy a $65 bag. It just went, the cost just went up. Um, a $65 bag of duck and potato diet for our lovely basset hound, Sweet Pea, who has sensitive skin. Okay? I love her to death, but my lord. Um, so if you lived on a farm, um, a single or a few cows or horses represented a, s a significant resource to the family. 25% of your income was spent on food, and one in four people worked in agriculture. So, so you either worked on a farm or somebody close to you did. Now, after World War II, the country realized substantial innovations in both farming and preventive medicine. So this allowed for larger farms, managing animal populations in, in limited confinement, where we really did focus on maximizing efficiency and productivity. Okay? What used to be called animal husbandry was now being called animal science. And again, as a result, the U.S. became pretty affluent. The majority of folks experienced food and financial security. And this security fueled social change. And those who were historically ignored, ignored and exploited did become a focus of our concern. And this is to say they, these, these folks and these other animals entered our circle of caring. And, and to talk about that, what is a circle of caring? Well, on the surface, I think it seems like our ethics are changing. I'm going to propose to you today they're not. I get that a lot from folks when I talk about this. They're like, we can't keep, it's a moving target. Everybody's ethics are changing. We can't, you know, keep up or, or manage that. So I want you to think about it a little differently. Our ethics are not changing. Simply put, the golden rule is still the golden rule. What has changed is to whom we extend consideration of the golden rule. Okay? And that's what some folks have referred to as this expansion of our circle of caring. So, so I think we all know someone who has a circle of caring around about like this. Um, we don't have to look too far back in our history to be a, a bit embarrassed by this circle. And I'm happy to say that the, the vast majority of people sort of function in this circle. And many have a circle that continues to grow. Okay? Now, it's okay to recognize that not all dogs, cats, or even cows are treated equally. Okay? This fact doesn't disrupt the entire concept. We have to appreciate that equal consideration does not demand equal treatment. Okay? I get a lot of farmers who say, you're going to make, you know, I let my dog sleep on my bed. You want me to let my cow sleep on my bed? No, I don't want you to let your cow sleep on your bed. I mean, if you want to, knock yourself out. Not a bright idea. Um, so the most important 
thing to understand here is that many consumers have extended the circle of caring to include farm animals. And once in that circle, they expect that we provide for them in ways that are congruent with their beliefs. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not implying that a person with some expansive circle of caring is somehow morally superior or something like that. And, and what we have to understand is really the impact of these expectations. And to explore that concept a little bit, I want to introduce to you um, an old friend of mine. This is Smokey. This is the one and only pet I was allowed to have as a kid. Two things to consider. Neither one of my parents were really what you call pet people. Um, my dad viewed animals as um, work and responsibility, and I, and I would agree. Um, growing up, the animals got fed before you did, and, and while he likes animals just fine, he just doesn't want to have to be bothered with, with you know, dealing with them and that responsibility. Um, my mom, uh, she was a different story. Um, she was California's answer uh, to Martha Stewart, um, the clean, tidy homemaker version, not the orange prison suit version. Um, and so to, to her, dogs and cats were just these dirty, hairy messes that belonged outside. Um, yet somehow, I, I managed to talk my parents into keeping this kitten that we found while camping, who eventually took over my dad's rocking chair. Um, but not too soon after that, Smokey found himself in a bit of a pickle. And so before we headed off to the vet's office, my dad sat me down, because I said I was going to go with him. And he's like, well, this isn't going to be good. And um, so he sat me down and said, Jennifer, before we go any further, you need to understand that we're not going to spend a bunch of money on this cat. So I said, yeah, I understood. And there we went, waiting our turn in the vet clinic. And, and the moment the vet headed our direction to look at this cat, I started crying. So my dad got up and took a breath and took Smokey from my lap and walked over and handed Smokey to, to the veterinarian. And he said five simple words, please make her stop crying. So a few days and a few hundred dollars later, um, my circle of caring remained perfectly intact. My dad's wallet was a little lighter, um, although to this day he swears he never defined how much a bunch of money was. So um, he still thinks he won that, but that's okay. So, so this is what I'm getting at, is, is everybody comes to this, even within close family circles. Everybody comes to these conversations a little bit differently in, in how they value a pet and how far they're willing to go. And we really need to appreciate how these differences in values and perspectives influence the behavior of others, even, even within family, okay? And, and we're dealing with a broad, you know, global community. So if you can imagine how much more difficult that makes it, okay? So we have to think about this because the fact is there is no amount of scientific evidence that is going to change these people's perspectives, okay? You cannot reason someone out of a position they did not reason themselves into. So we have to keep that in mind. So let's fast forward to 2010. Less than 10% of our income is spent on food. Less than 1% claim farming is an occupation. The average consumer today is geographically and conceptually removed from agriculture, okay? While in fact, some consumers express a good bit of trust in farmers, when you ask them, they're not exactly sure if they'd consider what we do today farming, okay? And that doubt, that concern stemming from that lack of understanding is where that door is left open for greater control and criticism, okay? And that's a, a door that left, when, when breached, compromises consumer trust, okay? And I know a lot of times we say we need to share our story, we need to connect with consumers, but the reality, the problem is, is much more complex than simply not being connected to agriculture. Our problem isn't going to go away simply by sharing our story, because it goes beyond consumers' perception of farms. It extends into the supermarket and restaurants and their perception of food. The animals we benefit from today are no longer seen as animals. They're pre-packaged, perfectly uniform. They hardly resemble an animal at all. Okay? We refer to them as broilers, loins, and nuggets. Okay? I don't know about you, but four years of vet school and PhD, I don't know where a nugget is on a chicken. Okay? So, so we've sort of promoted some of this disconnect. The second issue that makes this conversation even more tenable is the fact that the role animals play in our lives has changed dramatically. 
From an early age, children are familiarized with animals through media and entertainment. Animals and entertainment are made into heroes. So whether it's Babar, Babe, or Nemo, they're given voices, and with these voices, they have shared with us their wants, their needs, and even their dreams. While we have removed the animal from the food we eat, we have simultaneously elevated the animals in our lives. For many, cats and dogs are treated like members of the family. And in many cases, animal companions have become the primary and sometimes sole, stable, dependable form of companionship. People will go to great lengths to protect the animals who have become such important parts of their lives. <coughs> Studies have shown that abused women will remain in abusive situations because they are concerned for their pet's safety. A 1994 report demonstrated that 58% of homeless pet owners have gone without food in order to feed their pet. And yes, while many people seem to love the idea of farmers as stewards of the land, Farmers are then simultaneously characterized as profit mongers when we're associated with large farms and we're accused of being cruel when we're seen as approaching farming from a business rather than a way of life. Simply put, people want to know that we treat our animals well. We've, we've moved from having a social contract with farms, farm animals to simply trying to maintain a social license with consumers to benefit from animals and agriculture. Our ability to maintain this social license to benefit from animals is dependent on maintaining consumer trust. While trust was historically found in science and bolstered by economics, efficiency and pro productivity being our defense of ag practices, not anymore. Today, trust may be supported by science and economics, but the foundation of consumer trust is believing that businesses are grounded in shared core beliefs of fairness, compassion, and doing the right thing. We need to understand that when trust is lost, there's consequences. And these consequences are very real and significant because they invite increased social control and that increases cost. And most importantly, we need to understand that these consequences are not limited to the bad actor. When one falls, the rest will follow. Now, if we look at the social sciences, and, and try to understand to where trust is given, we, we can look to see, if we look at the y-axis here, um, and we look at the trust given, and on the x-axis, different types of businesses, you can see that when it comes to big businesses, like Dean, like McDonald's, trust is pretty low. And why is that? Well, that's because they're seen by consumers as, as being self-serving, okay? We care because that's how we get our best return on investment. Now, keep that in mind. Because so often in agriculture, when we're criticized, our first go-to message is, of course we take care, good care of our cows. If we didn't, they wouldn't produce, right? That's our main go-to message. Well, you have to understand is when we say that, what a consumer actually hears, well, if I could get away with treating my cows poorly and still make money, I would, okay? Our message from agriculture should and must be, we take care of our cows because it's the right thing to do, period. And even more importantly, our behavior has to reflect that message consistently. Along this continuum, we have compliance organizations like the government, and they say we follow the rules. They're given a little bit more trust. And there's an ever-increasing number of what we call not-for-profit-only companies. Uh, a good example is Tom Shoes, where they, you buy a $50 pair of sandals, and every time you buy one, they give a pair to some kid somewhere who needs a pair of shoes in some country. Um, so they've been afforded a great deal of trust. But on the far end, we have what we call principle-driven organizations, and they're seen by consumers as being worthy of a social license because they're perceived as having a shared value and ethic. What's important to understand is currently, Agriculture has no voice in this arena. Some might offer that, that we have some represent, rep, representatives, like veterinarians, and we're given a great deal of trust. But what we have to remember in agriculture is that if our veterinary profession or agriculture professionals are seen as functioning in this self-serving circle, or even the compliance-oriented circle, rather than that one based on principle, we not only lose our credibility, we may lose our professional standing with the consumer community. So if you're just tuning into the animal welfare conversation, I'll give you the, the cliff note version because that's how I made it through college. Um, it's, it's more than science. It's more than economics. It's fundamentally about ethics. 
It's important to reconcile this idea in our minds as our ability to acknowledge these ethical conflicts will determine our success in maintaining that social license between farmer and consumer. We need to reconcile that ethical knowing is different from other knowing. While it's not science-based, it can be informed by science, but it's not like math. It's not meant to describe how the world is. It's meant to describe how the world ought to be. Well, not based solely on feelings, it can become with, begin with some basic ethical assumptions, like the golden rule. We need to recognize that good production does not guarantee good welfare. We simply cannot defend our practices with pounds. Why? Well, because it's not necessarily true, and it, it makes us appear quite ingenuine, and it won't stand up to public scrutiny. We need to recognize, though, that farmers are confronted with ethical decisions every day. Not everything you do on the farm, or decide not to do, can be boiled down to economics and efficiency. An example is that three-legged cow that still manages to milk 60 pounds, or maybe it's a really sick beef cow who's, you know, seven months pregnant and you still want to get a calf out of her. Okay. Either way, it's enough based on current feed prices that it, quote, pays to keep her. It pays to keep her until she's too thin or she's too lame. And then where does she go? How long does she have to walk around in discomfort, suffering, in pain, before you load her up on a trailer and she goes to the sale yard? And then when she goes to the sale yard, how long and uncomfortable or comfortable is that journey to the slaughterhouse? If she gets to the slaughterhouse and needs to be euthanized on the trailer because she can't even get up, can I really look a consumer in the eye and tell them we did the right thing? We have to come to terms with the fact that science can only tell us what we can do. What we're dealing with today are questions of what we should do. Science spreadsheets and bank ledgers aren't going to answer this question. What will be considered acceptable is that which is based on which passes through what I call this social of our, this filter of our social ethic. We have to wrap our heads around the fact that there are some things that society simply will not support. I mentioned earlier that we have to recognize all the determinants of animal welfare. I think the key, again, is that neither one of these principles is always given a priority. But we also have to understand that we bring to the table our own biases, right? As a veterinarian, I would say this was my bias for a long time. And I would say for some animal rights groups or some animal, even welfare specialists, this is their bias. But I think we need to be honest about what those biases are. So with that, what do we think people think of us? Um, so I came home uh, from work one day, and my husband showed me this magazine that had this survey um, in, in the magazine. And so this was a Purdue survey that found, uh, over s looking at 798 folks, that 19% of consumers chose the Humane Society of the United States, or PETA, as their go-to source for animal welfare information. Okay, folks like our, this was an Amer U.S. survey, folks like our National Pork Board, our National Milk Producers, um, they garnered 1%. And then I felt really bad. Um, my husband pointed out that the AVMA, our veterinary association, came in at 2%, uh, just behind social media, which was at 4%. And so, um, and yet I, I kind of laugh, because as a profession, whether it's veterinarians or even in agriculture, we keep telling everybody that we're the welfare experts, right? Well, clearly the consumers aren't seeing that, they're going to someone else. And so the science is in though. The, the, the weight of the evidence, uh, recognizing the important roles of emotion and the nature of animals in their welfare far outweighs the weight of what is now an archaic argument that health is all that matters. A and we don't all seem to be there. And what's funny is our, our consumers are there. The consumers are there. And what I find interesting was that for them it, it was apparently intuitive that animals have feelings and emotional states. And we continue to have to work with folks in agriculture to help them understand that animals have feelings. And so, you know, then I open another magazine, because my husband just likes to just drill it you know, when I get home, like, here's another depressing moment, here's another one. So then I open this magazine, and I find this quote. 
So our animals can't turn around for the two and a half years that they're in stalls producing piglets. I don't know who asked the sow if she wanted to turn around, but the only real measure of her well-being we have is the number of piglets per birth, and that's at an all-time high. So then I have to scratch my head, and I wonder, like, am I surprised people are criticizing us when we apparently don't seem to get it, and we don't even seem to listen to the own science that we actually produce? So we can take a look then, uh, how are we doing? And this is from a, a dairy industry perspective. So this is, what, this is what normal average looked like when I went to a slaughterhouse, okay? On average, they said this is an average cold cow day. Two out of seven cows were down on arrival on the trailer. One, two fell down while stepping off the trailer. One more was so skinny and weak that she fell down later in the day trying to navigate the system. And what was great was that all five of these cows were perfectly handled by the guys at the slaughterhouse. They did an excellent job. They were humanely euthanized as well. But what fired me up is that all five of those cows should have never been put on a trailer to begin with. And that is the reality we have to face. And we have to accept and be accountable for the decisions we make in sending cows to slaughter. We have to understand that the animals we send to slaughter, well that didn't work either, um, are a direct reflection of our care and compassion. So that should have been a picture of a calf at a slaughterhouse with a broken leg, okay? So the sale barns, that's where the public is free to peer into our world. Okay? And a calf brought to a local sale barn with a broken leg. Okay? It wasn't an undercover video. I, I took the picture. I was free to do so. Nobody was hiding anything. Okay? What's the problem with that? Okay? This, this isn't acceptable. We can't sell and put animals through slaughter and sale barns that are suffering. Again, that's what the customer sees. That's what the world sees. And that is a direct reflection of our compassion and care. And we can't deny it. So why don't we seem to get it? And what isn't resonating with these efforts to communicate with the public to, quote, share our story? Okay? How do we think our message is resonating? Well, we publicly condemn these things when we see them plastered on the TV. But what are we really doing to prevent it? It's crucial for us to understand that for today, consumer, consumers' transparency is fundamental. Okay? We, they want to know that we are being honest and authentic, not just in our communication, but in our efforts. Customers today, those drivers I talked about, they're well-read, and they understand animal welfare, and they understand the consequences of not living up to consumer expectations. So what are the issues, and what are consumers and customers worried about? Well, from a consumer perspective, it's actually pretty simple. Um, consumers are uncomfortable when we abuse, neglect, or treat animals inhumanely. Not rocket science, I don't think, okay? What does this translate into? Simply put, they don't like it when we do painful things without providing relief from pain. They don't like it when we cut parts off for unacceptable reasons. They don't like it when we stuff them into tiny spaces. And they really don't like it when we euthanize them in ways that appear or are inhumane. It's actually that simple. They're not asking for too much. Now, what do our customers want? Well, customers don't like it when their consumers are upset, so you can just go back to the previous slide and figure out what gets them riled up, okay? because they don't need consumers to complain. But what they really, really don't like is when their brand gets drugged through the mud. So whether it's antibiotics, animal care, use of hormones, whatever it is, we can't afford to have the brand drugged through the mud. The reality is the society has this expectation of us and that they expect, pretty simply, the way we take good care of our cows. <coughs> and provide for them in ways that have good welfare. And where we sit today is sort of on one end of that. And, and the issues aren't just videos of people doing some really questionable and stupid things. 
The reality in many of our industries is that abnormal has become normal. In dairy, our reality is that average herd lameness is greater than 25%. Calf mortality, greater than 10%. Hawk lesions in some regions, greater than 50%. Abnormal has become normal. I actually can't defend to a consumer and say that it's okay that 25% of a herd could possibly be lame. Okay? So what are we going to do? Well, how do we manage this? Here's my idea, so again, you might not all agree with this, but um, these are some simple things that I think the public needs to hear, and more importantly, needs to see from you. So these next few slides are admittedly how I see, see the world, and um, you might disagree. Um, but every day, whether it's in response to a bad video or while you're standing in line at the checkout, the only answers that will resonate with consumers are these. I accept the responsibility of making sure my cows are well cared for. It is my responsibility to make sure that the people who work for me know the right thing to do and are held accountable for doing it. And yes, I will embrace accountability. And whether it's through animal welfare audits or other compliance programs, I am going to have to document what I do and how I act. That is the only thing that is going to get us ahead of what could be a potentially very costly and cumbersome process when it comes to animal welfare. Equally important is to understand what the public doesn't want to hear. And, of course, they don't want to see your employees abuse or neglect cows. I, I shouldn't even have to mention that. But they don't want to hear excuses, okay? How many of you here have kids or you've ever been a kid? Okay, anybody paying attention? Okay, so... You're still awake, that's good. Um, okay, we all know, we've all been there as kids, right? We're great at making excuses. Well, put very simply, <laughs> excuses make us appear childish, okay? We gotta stop making excuses. When, when scientific policy supports, scientific evidence supports the policies we make, it's kind of hard to argue with it. But a great example for that is in the US, we have all the, the science in the world that tells us that tail docking shouldn't be allowed and shouldn't be done. And yet we still have people arguing with us that we have to do it and act like the sky is going to fall if we can't keep doing it. Okay? We have to be willing to listen to the science and then live with the result we get. Okay? Another great example, when we talk about cull cows. Okay? What's the first thing I hear from farmers when, I, when we have these conversations about what you can and can't send to slaughter? First thing they do is say, well, if the packer wouldn't take them, I wouldn't send them. Somewhere... We, you, I, every farmer, is going to have to be accountable for our own actions, and we can't pass the buck and make an excuse. Blame. Okay. We fired the worker. Isn't that the best quick response we have, you know, on the farm? Okay. We have to get to a point when we understand that we're about done with our ability of just simply saying we fired the worker, okay? When we do that, when we say that, it simply appears that we have been asleep at the wheel, okay? And that excuse is not going to work any longer. And I get it, some of these videos, they're manipulations, and they show some things that are perfectly fine, like AIing a cow or whatever. Um, and I'm not surprised by those bits. I can have conversations around some of the video bits. But I do get fired up. The bits in these videos of, of people cursing at cows, and, and I'll admit, I am a, I'm a potty mouse. I'll admit it. I try to keep it in check, but sometimes, whew. Um, but when I see these people cursing and kicking and the things that come out of their mouths and what they're calling these cows, I am just shocked. So you can't tell me that it was one bad employer that it was staged. We need to establish a culture on every farm where we don't refer to cows with profanities and we certainly don't treat them like one. And more importantly, if an employee is asked to do something stupid on your farm so somebody can catch a video of them doing it, their one and only response that they should know is the right response is that the answer is not on this farm. We have to do the training. We have to let them know that there is a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things on the farm. 
Because again, there will come a time when firing people is not going to be enough. And again, when it comes to some practices, you know, we just have to get over the fact that some things aren't going to be accepted. There is no industry standard gibberish that I could tell any consumer to defend blunt force trauma with anything other than a, a gun or a captive bolt gun, dehorning without pain mitigation, underfeeding calves, keeping lame cows milking without treatment. And again, beef has its own issues. Okay? There's no industry standard that I am going to tell anybody that they'll be like, oh, okay, I get it, that's fine. Okay? It ain't going to work. We just have to get over it. <coughs> now, this one kills me. Okay? We just need to explain. This is the, the best one, I think. Um, I get it. We hear it all the time, and I talked about it today. The vast majority of folks are separated from agriculture. So what? They don't understand what you do. That's okay. Okay? Um, this has been the worst excuse we've had to defend ourselves, and it's the go-to message time and time again. You just need to share your story. You just need to, to tell people. Let's just think about it for a minute. How many of you here have been on a plane? Hands? Okay. How'd it go? You're here, so I assume it went well. Maybe you lost your luggage, but um, it was safe. It was pretty much on time. You got to the right airport, I hope, right? Well, you know, my, my dad uh, was an airline mechanic for 40 years. He tore engines apart and put them back together. Do I have a clue as to how a plane works, how it flies, how it gets up there? I don't have any idea how they get from point A to point B. Yet, I have an expectation of how airlines function, okay? Do I expect them to get it done right and on time? I do. So newsflash agriculture it is perfectly okay for you and I and everyone else to have an expectation of the people and companies we do business with, even if we have little to no understanding of what they do. Okay? You're not alone. Don't feel bad. Apple makes computers. I don't know how they make computers, but I expect that they do it in a way that doesn't ruin the environment, that treats their employees well. Okay? I expect them to follow the law. So we're not alone. We're just kind of late to the party in it, really. Okay? So we just got to wrap our heads around the fact that, yeah, people don't understand what we do. Does that mean they can't have expectations for how we do it? No. Again, because we're not going to educate our way out of pain mitigation, tail docking, too many lame cows. Okay? These are things that we can do a better job at, and we're going to be hold, held accountable to doing it. Last but not least is, oops, is uh, take the high road. I get a lot of folks when we start talking about making changes on the farm, and they get frustrated because they feel like we're always asking more and more. And I think sometimes farmers feel a little guilty um, when all of a sudden we have to, to, to provide pain mitigation. It's a great example. A farmer asked me today, or uh, I went to an old client and said, Jen, does it mean I was a bad guy because I didn't used to provide pain mitigation? And I dehorned my calves at 12 weeks? I mean, was I, was I a horrible person? No, you weren't a horrible person, okay? You did the best you knew how, and that's fine. And as we learn more, we'll have to change. And so you do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, we have to do better, okay? That's the key. So we're going to have to change. We're going to have to start doing things a little bit differently. Does that mean we were horrible people six months ago, two years ago? No, it doesn't. It just means we're learning and we're getting better. And again, last but not least, stay out of the mud pit. Everybody knows how crazy the crazy people are. We don't need to jump in there and start attacking them back. It doesn't really do any good. It doesn't help us out. You know, just take the high road. Talk about what you're doing, how you're trying to do better, and how you're going to fix it, and how you take it seriously. That message resonates much more than simply defending old practices that we simply can't anymore. I'm going to skip forward, running out of time. Um, so, so in the end, just remember that, that if we're going to get ahead of this, um, we're going to have to get ahead of it by communicating and acting with transparency by holding ourselves and each other accountable and welcoming that accountability. And we're going to do it by aiming for the highest mark, 
not just accepting some minimum standard that we can all meet. Because when it comes down to it, that's all that consumers really want. Okay? We're obliged to treat these animals in our care with kindness, not because they have rights, but precisely because they don't. Because they stand before us powerless and unequal. And for all that they give us, and for all that we take, we do owe them. We owe them a good life, and we owe them a good death. And that's really all the consumers are asking for us. And with that, I probably used up all my time and have no time for questions. But then, thank you very much. Hello, my name is Brian Whedon. I'm a rancher from the Swift Current area. I represented stock growers on the Foundation for Animal Care for several years. And we work closely with the SPCA. And it's interesting in your topic, there's one thing. Amount where, <coughs> excuse me, ignorance. Number one cause in, when a it, situation requires their investigation is usually a direct result of a breakdown of a family through financial issues, sickness, um, uh, you know, other re related divorce and things like that. There's very little work has been done or effort has been made into trying uh, and help people when they are in, in distress. And it's a tough one to gauge because sometimes it takes five years before you even see the, the, the decay of the situation there. And I'm wondering if you had any ideas on how we could set up a better network collectively to uh, avoid some of these situations. No, I think that's an excellent point, and, and we see that in dairy. I, I worry when milk prices fluctuate, you know, that's one of the first things that go, one of the first things that goes up is animal welfare when milk prices are high, and it's probably the first thing we cut back on when, when milk prices go down. I don't know that I have a great answer. I think part of this whole idea of, of the fact that we'll be out there looking and visiting farms and auditing will help identify those issues sooner. And, and do that, but it, it also comes back to, you know, I mentioned about farms getting cut off when they've had a problem. Um, if anything, that just makes the lives of the animals worse, and so that's why I've struggled with why, why that's the response we're taking. If, if the goal is to, to improve and promote animal welfare, we need to get in there and dig in and help make it better, not make it worse, and so I, um, I don't think I, I, again, I have a, a, a reasonable answer, but I think, you know, your SPCA appears had a different approach than we've had down in, in, the, in the US. And so I think those are, are great things in, in raising that awareness where um, even within our community that when folks, I talk to so many farmers who they know that there was a problem on a farm, nobody wants to say anything. And I think if there's a way to, 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 to shine a light on that in a, in a way that, that's not accusatory, that tries to help sort of, again, get them out of the situation they're in, that, I think that's a huge, that's maybe a first start. Because, I mean, again, I talk to so many farmers, well, I'm not going to tell them how to, mm, and they don't want to be the one. But sometimes that's what we need, because, you know, you're, if no one else sees it, you know, what are you, what are you going to do until you, you raise that awareness? But I think it's an excellent point. You know, one, one thing we did do was uh, add an animal component to the farm crisis line with some coaching, and I think this needs to be more better advertised and, and more support needs to okay. be given for something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you very much for sharing. Chip. And good morning. Uh, Dan Darling's my name. Uh, just uh, interest in your comment about um, antibiotics in, in livestock production. I always find that's a very confusing topic. So we have animal, we, the right, animals have rights and, and, and we want to humanely treat them. And then you get into antibi not using antibiotics or antibiotic free. So animals get sick just like humans get sick. And if we're good stewards of our animals and whatnot, we, we have to treat them. Absolutely. Um, now it's kind of evolved into you know, vaccinations in many cases aren't necessarily a great thing because we're giving thing, them uh, a live vaccine, which is actually giving them that, that sickness. So, so where do we find that fine line? Where do we tell our producers what that fine line is? Because at the end of the day, the consumer says, we don't want anything that's been treated with antibiotics. 
well, where do they think they're going to go? Yeah, I think, and that's a great, great question. And, and so I, I certainly, I think, I think programs um, that, that are saying no antibiotics are actually, I think it's a huge animal welfare concern. I think it's irresponsible if, if, if I think it's irresponsible from a, from a, social aspect, if you're going to raise animals for food and production and benefit from animals, you are responsible for caring for them, which means making every effort that they don't get sick, but certainly when they get sick, they deserve treatment and care just like any other person or animal. So they, I think it's quite irresponsible in my own personal opinion. Um, what's interesting though is some, it hasn't been published yet, but I talked to somebody the other day who's done some sort of social science research on this, and, and when you actually talk to consumers, they don't mind that we use antibiotics to treat sick animals. What they don't like is this idea that's been falsely promoted out there, and, and, and in some cases, probably, again, we need to look at our practices and say, do we really need to do that, um, is, is that we're just feeding them antibiotics for the sake of feeding it, to, for the sake of gains and production, right? They don't like that idea, but absolutely, without doubt, people, in that survey said, absolutely, if an animal is sick, you better treat it. And so I think we need to make sure we manage that expectation very well. I think we're expected to minimize disease. We shouldn't have systems. We shouldn't manage systems that, that cause increase in the need for antibiotics. I think that's an issue. But on the other side, absolutely, if an animal gets sick, it should be treated. And, and the consumer work, when you dig a little deeper into that, would tell you that they're actually okay with that. So, which I think is a good thing. I was happy that I, I again, hopefully the paper will get out here shortly. But, did that answer your question? Yes. 